Great. Good afternoon. My name is Rex Castro, um, and this is my presentation for CNT 6418, the online version, Digital Forensics 2. Uh, this is in regards to history of digital forensics as well as famous cases. So, um, to start off with, um, these are the topics I'm going to be going over in my presentation. The first is the infancy, or the, this is in regards to the history of digital forensics. The first is the infancy of digital forensics, and this is just the beginning of uh, the, the field, um, what kind of tools were used during this, this period of time, um, and the limitations of digital forensics back in the early 1980s. Um, next would be the growth and advances, and this would be this would cover um, uh, the period of the mid 90s to about 2005 ish, and then as well as the present and how far digital forensics has come from uh, the infancy era. And then finally, I will discuss um, famous cases uh, in regards to digital forensics, specifically the first case to ever use digital forensics to convict. Um, the suspect, uh, as well as um, another case that's pretty uh, widely known. So, start off with we will go into the infancy of digital forensics. Um, uh, in the 1980s, law enforcement's agency see potential uh, of digital forensics. Um, computers back then were just starting to be used. Uh, as we all know, they weren't really user friendly. They were really hard to use. Um, but uh, early early on, they knew that this is where um, uh, technolo technology was going to be the future. People would be using it, and it was important to understand it because this would be a nece it would be a nece necessity um, to understand uh, if they have people have access to it, if law enforcement has access to it. It's only a matter of time before criminals would be able to use it, and it's important to be on top of this because if they, if criminals were ahead of the curve and they were having access to this and they were getting uh, uh, committing crime with this kind of technology and we weren't familiar with it, then we would be behind and it wouldn't be a good situation. Um, in the mid-1990s, uh, the FBI hosts two conferences resulting in the creation of the International Organization on Computer Evidence. <clears throat> and then see continued. Um, so in the beginning of digital forensics, cases mostly involved around data recovery. Um, basically, that was the only thing that you could really do at this time. Um, computers were too costly um, to do really anything else. And not and a lot of people had experience with computers, so at this point of time, this is where digital forensics was at, just strictly data recovery. Um, there was a major issue with, with digital forensics around this time. Um, there were two primary reasons. The first was that storage was costly. Um, as you know, technology back in the day was really expensive. Um, and in order to recover things, you would need a lot of memory, uh, especially con especially considered by today's standards. You consider how much storage truly is. Back then, it was even more. Um, mega megabytes were considered what gigabytes were today. Um, so if you consider that, that was kind of that would be a major reason. Um, why uh, data recovery was such a hard thing to do. Um, another reason why uh, digital forensics was having such a hard time back in that kind of, in that time period was that users were constantly deleting and reformatting data. Um, and nowadays this isn't really a problem because we have tools such as WinHex or Autopsy or FTK or InCase where if you upload an image onto the program, you can see all the files that are on there. Um, you can tell if something was deleted or not. If something was deleted, per, uh, most likely the metadata would still be on it. So you could find 
you can find it if something was hidden in free space you can go examine free space um, and look for that file of metadata or that file um, but back then this didn't exist this didn't exist um, and that was a major issue if if there was there if, if we have trouble nowadays trying to find information that's deleted or used or reformatted or hidden um, back then it was even harder so this was the second major issue uh, with digital forensics um, back in this time period. Okay. So these were the tools used during the infancy of digital forensics. Um, command line tools were the primary uh, tools utilized. Uh, some of the ones that I found that were used um, were the IRS utilities, uh, Marisware, uh, ISIX utilities, and RCMP utilities. And the primary um, use for these tools were various tasks, but were primarily used for imaging um, and, to, and to locate uh, deleted files. Uh, there was also Norton Utilities and PC tools, and these were also heavily used. Um, these were used for data recovery and file management. And as uh, time uh, from the 1980s going until the 1990s, this was one of the major tools utilized, uh, especially during uh, forensics training for uh, government agencies, state and local agencies as well. So these were two of the primary issues that I found um, during the beginning of digital forensics. The first was uh, criminals were operating across large areas in real time. Um, and examiners were unable to keep up with said criminals. So this is, was in regards to a lot of the like telecommunications um, scams that were going on. Um, criminals were say um, were in different states or you know across states and were committing crimes that were in vastly different areas from where they were residing. Um, and examiners, they're not, back then, they weren't linked to each other the way they are now. So it was really hard to try to cross-reference with one another uh, in those different areas. So really, if, they were, if there's only a group of examiners and they would congregate with one another, um, and they, were, they didn't really have that huge, uh, digital forensics was so new that they didn't have that huge group where they were able to talk to one another in different parts of the areas um, in order to um, work together on solving crimes. And this was one of the big issues, that is that criminals were often um, getting away with a lot of crime because of this. Um, there, another reason was there's no dedicated laboratory space. Once again, Digital forensics was so new that there was no laboratories um, or dedicated laboratories available for examiners. So for the most part, people were conducting examinations in basements, in offices, in individual offices. Um, nothing specifically made for uh, or built into like a federal or local or state um, government building. And that was an issue because not as like today there's always laboratories in like local law enforcement for example so if uh, investigators found a phone for example they were able to you know take it into the laboratory the laboratory was able to examine it and relay the information back to the investigator that brought them the phone initially however this wasn't the case back then as laboratories weren't in the buildings for example so relaying information was a lot more difficult um, in that regard. Okay, so moving on to the next 10 years uh, after the infancy of digital forensics, this is the time period where it truly experienced a boom, um, and this was due to three reasons. Um, an increase in use of technology during this time period, the, the mid-90s to early 2000s, uh, we saw a rise in the internet um, and cell phones just technology in general, people were using, utilizing it more, um, and law enforcement was finally um, getting on track to f familiarizing itself with it. 
Um, the second reason why digital forensics experienced such a boom was an increase in child pornography cases. Um, and as we all know, most of these people who have this kind of uh, information, they have been storing it on computers, they message people over the internet, um, they store pictures, videos, and digital forensics. That's one of the main um, subject matter digital forensics tries to uncover and tries to prosecute people who have that information uh, on their uh, devices. Um, and then the third reason was the use of computers in terrorist activities. Um, it's important, the internet is so large, uh, it's so much easier to relay information now that it's a necessity for people to keep track of all activity, especially suspicious activity that's being relayed onto um, the internet, message boards, all that kind of stuff. Um, and for example, um, the case that happened in California, where the terrorist went on a shooting incident, um, he was using a phone. Um, the government, FBI, wanted to use that phone because they believe there's more uh, information on it, um, and it was in the terrorist uh, possession. And it's just a testament to uh, uh, what people use, um, what terrorists use uh, technology uh, more frequently nowadays. So you can see with like ISIS when they from out there like <clears throat> recruitment videos, that kind of that sort of thing. Um, so digital forensics is able to go use that and uncover any information on phones, computers that could be related to any other terrorist activities or possibly um, uh, what the reason behind the person's activity was. So updated tools. Um, we also experienced updated tools within this period of time. Um, examiners transitioned from a command line tool to interfaces. So we're in the infancy. We used all those command line tools that I mentioned before on the previous slides. Um, interfaces now were becoming a thing, a widely used uh, tool. Um, as we know, InCase and Forensics Toolkit, or FTK, um, InCase actually used to be called Expert Witness, and through time uh, received updates and became what we know as InCase today. Um, and these, tool, these two in particular have become a staple tool amongst examiners today, as we all know, because they do such a great amount of things. Um, and they provide us with such a great amount of information um, in regards to uncovering data on you know, phones, hard drives, or whatever it may be. Um, another uh, tool, another update to tools that we experienced during this time um, was the use of Linux tools. Um, and you know, we've we've in this class have used Paladin, and are familiar with all the tools that have been, uh, that are used within that um, operating system. Um, and just to name a few, Helix, Sleuth Kit, and Autopsy, which we're all familiar with, um, these actually saw a rise in use during this time period as well. Okay, moving on, laboratories um, during this time, dedicated laboratories became established, which was very important because there was zero to no effort to make uh, established dedicated laboratories in the beginning of digital forensics um, and these are just a couple of the most major ones that were established um, the defense computer forensics laboratory used by the department of defense uh, a regional the regional computer forensics laboratories uh, used by the fbi um, federal state and local law enforcement um, they all have their own jurisdictions and they all cross-reference with the, with one another um, they're all connected and that one is a major, major uh, development uh, for digital forensics, um, as well as the U.S. Secret Service um, established network of electronic crimes task force. Okay, and then moving on to the present, uh, examiners are now better trained than they were in the past. Digital forensics conferences allow for research to be conducted to make further advances within the field. Um, as we talked about before in Digital Forensics 1, um, we've made so much progress, but we're starting to slowly fall behind a little bit. 
and that's because not a lot of research is being conducted, not a lot of t on tools, and tools are becoming outdated, and there's not a lot of updating going on. Um, so it's important for these conferences to continue because this allows people to conduct research and hopefully make uh, further advances uh, within the field um, that we really need. Um, and then during this time period as well, in the present, uh, tools have also experienced more developing power. Um, now tools that automate extraction and review data, um, like WinHex, um, for example, like when we open up an image, um, there's an option where you can um, scan for deleted partitions, and it'll actually automate that extraction and find any deleted partitions and then recover any of the deleted data that's also stored within those partitions, which is amazing, um, which was something that was, like I mentioned before, was hard to do in the infancy of digital forensics, but now it's such an easy thing to do now, which is super helpful. So moving on to the famous cases uh, involving digital forensics, I'm just going to talk about two of them. The first one is the BTK killer, and then the second one involves um, Michelle Thier. So the BTK killer, the first case solved using digital forensics. Um, the individual involved in, in this case, Dennis Rader, uh, in a span of 15 years, killed 10 people sending police taunting notes after the incidents. In 2004, Raider sent police a note in the form of a document stored on a floppy disk. Um, and he sent that floppy disk to the police. Examiners utilized InCase to analyze the floppy disk um, and found the metadata belonging to the document that Raider sent. The clue that led police to Raider was the name Dennis within the metadata, as well as the location where the document was actually modified. Um, and after the, how many years Raider was able to go uncaptured, um, it took just a simple floppy disk. It just shows you how, how digital forensics, the power of digital forensics, um, examining that floppy disk um, was able to lead them directly to him. Um, the FBI and then police traced Raider to Christ Lutheran Church, um, where Raider actually worked, and this is where the document was modified. And as a result, they located Raider and they arrested him. Okay, and then moving on to the final uh, famous case involving digital forensics. Uh, December 17th, 2000, uh, John Diamond killed uh, Marty Thier. Um, the case later went to court uh, and the defense claimed there was no evidence linking Diamond to the murder. Um, however, we all know that this wasn't true. Um, the defense claimed that there was no physical evidence um, and there was no evidence linking the two individuals to one another. Um, digital evidence confirmed, though, a relationship, relationship existed between Michelle Thier, Marty's wife, and John Diamond. They were able to come up with this because there was a ton of emails and messages um, sent between one another confirming that they were involved in a sexual relationship as well as um, their um, messages confirming that they conspired to kill Marty. Um, and then this was also, this is a perfect example of um, forensics examiners using these messages to able to confirm um, uh, that, the per that John Diamond killed Marty Thier. And without these advancements that we made within this time period, if, say, for example, this was the early, early stages of digital forensics, this probably wouldn't have even been able, this wouldn't have even been a possibility to find these messages or go through a computer and find any of this. Because, one, messages wouldn't have even existed. And, two, if the defense was right and the 
police or law enforcement weren't able to find a single clue linking Diamond to the murder, then he would have just went, he would have got away with it. And this just shows you how important it actually is. Okay. And this is my citation for the um, history of the, uh, the source that I use for the history of digital forensics. And that is my presentation.